welcome to the book launch of A Normal Life, which is Freedom's latest uh, uh, publication. It's the autobiography of Vasilis Paliakostas, who is infamous in Greece for robbing a bunch of banks and taking people hostage and so forth. He's probably the most successful bank robber in Greece. And we're here, um, we're publishing his autobiography, and ideally when you publish the autobiography of somebody, you would have them there to, you know, talk about their life and introduce themselves and talk about the writing of the book and stuff. Uh, but fortunately and unfortunately, so unfortunately he's not here, and he can't be here, because fortunately he escaped from prison in 2009, <laughs> and is free and on the run and is not being captured, which is uh, a good thing, and we're all wishing well wherever he is. It does present some logistical problems though, however, it's very unlikely that we could get him to turn up to do a book event, and we definitely wouldn't be streaming on Facebook Live if we did. So, what we have decided to do is, as a press, we're going to talk about the book, we're going to give a little introduction to Basilis' life and his story, uh, we're going to talk about why we're publishing the book and the kind of process we'd, we'd like to talk on in uh, bringing it about. Um, so. And we're going to be, these are uh, two people who are on camera, going to be doing the introduction. I feel like I'm on a quiz show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can better get ready for these questions. What's the first question? So my first question is, for those who don't know who Vasilis is and, and what he did, could you give a little background about his life and the context in which he was? No. So Vasilis Paleocostris is certainly the most famous and one of the most successful uh, bank robbers in Greece. Uh, he kind of falls into... It's a category that's, that's named by uh, the person who does the foreword for the book, uh, Polycarpos Geodalis. Uh, I'm going to mangle some names. I do apologise for that. I don't know speaks to you better than I do. He kind of describes the, the concept of the social bandit in Greek literature and in Greek popular culture as sort of like the Robin Hood role, but with a great uh, with a form of anti-colonialism as well, because Greece obviously was ruled by the Ottoman Empire until it uh, managed independence in, the, in 1822, I think. But in that long period, one of the key groups or groupings of people who fought back against the Ottoman Empire were the outlaws and the bandits, who used to, you know, essentially act as highwaymen, sort of robbing the, uh, the Turkish uh, troops and merchants and whatnot as they went, went past. And they were kind of considered as figures of the resistance, essentially. So you have, for example, uh, Antonis Katsantinus um, in 1777-1808, who he kind of mixed robbing the Ottomans and giving the money back to the peasantry with uh, essentially fighting as a, as a rebel in the mountains. A lot of these people did come from the mountains, sort of goat hoeing communities, villages, all this kind of stuff. Um, and Vasilis kind of leans very heavily into this as a kind of background, because he himself was born in uh, 1968 and was the son of a goat herder um, in the mountains just uh, Pindus mountain range um, just to the west of uh, Thessaly. He grew up in a very, very poor family uh, with, I think, five siblings. Um, and one of those siblings was Nikos, who was his big brother, uh, older than him by seven years, I think. They basically got into... Uh, robbing as they both got into kind of going out of it. The, 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 the kind of the form of the, of the crime they did was initially very, uh, very kind of, you know, just robbing radios out of cars, that kind of stuff, um, until Nikos was jailed. And in fact, the first story in the book is of Vasilis, then very early 20s, breaking his brother out of prison via the quite low-tech method of throwing a weighted rope over the over the wall. <laughs> kind of like something out of a Warner Brothers cartoon. <laughs> and his brother just like nipping over the wall again. His brother was recalled uh, and then he, with another man, cost us the artist Samaras. They all have amazing nicknames in Spain. <laughs> Vasilis is known by three separate nicknames, which is the Un Uncatchable, the Greek Robin Hood, and St. Basil. And St. Basil in Orthodox Greek religion is, is essentially Santa, near enough. His brother was known as the Phantom, and, and, and Costas was the artist. So the Uncatchable and the artist attempted to break the, um, break the Phantom out again um, by ramming a truck through the wall of the prison. Uh, this did not go entirely well, and they got caught. Um, but basically the, 
this this started a long series of, of um, robberies, uh, which Costas kind of acted as a, a as trainer for, for Vasilis. Um, but Vasilis kind of had a much more left wing uh, sort of libertarian bent, not sort of full on anarchist. He was a big fan, for example, of um, the 17 November movement, which is a Marxist Leninist sort of. Uh, revolutionary outfit at the time but he was sort of uh, very much into kind of uh, anarchist politics as well and liberalism and all this kind of stuff they quickly ramped up their um, their activities and the first really big event was the Kalabaka hunt um, which was at still is in fact the, uh, the biggest um, bank robbery in Greek history uh, which was which they did 500 yards away from the local cop shop which <laughs> As you might imagine, the, both the scale and the humiliation did not <laughs> endear him to the police at the time. Um, and he swiftly became one of the most, possibly the most wanted man in Greece. Um, this was only worsened when he started pioneering, again, he and his brother, started pioneering the art of the of ransoming CEOs. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a wonderful section in his book in which he kind of goes through the process in which he uh, started selecting who he wanted to wanted to ransom um, and he started going through people and saying well he's not quite enough of a bastard or oh well you know he's, he's you know, a bit of a he's, he's nice to his, to, to, his, to his workers and then eventually a light on this guy called Alexander Heiterglue um, and Heiterglue is uh, a he's, a he's a supporter of uh, one of the, uh, the very far right organisation uh, which was to do with kind of Macedonian um, border um, stuff and that kidnap is essentially what turns uh, Vasilis into a full-on household name in Greece. Um, the, the fallout from that saw him then spend years on the run until he was eventually caught uh, due, due to a car crash. He then goes through two stints in prison. The first time he escapes by helicopter from Corridalis prison. And the second time he escapes by helicopter from Corridalis prison. <laughs> <laughs> you might think that the prison guards would a bit more wary at the same time, but, uh, as it turns out now. Um, Does that prison still function? Oh yeah, yeah, it's the biggest prison in Greece. Um, <laughs> Had anyone else tried to escape by helicopter? Uh, so, there have been other prison helicopter escapes since, most notably from a French prison, which was essentially a carbon copy one. But he is, as far as I know, the only person to have escaped from prison twice by helicopter. Um, <laughs> And he has essentially been on the run ever since. Um, obviously, the second of these helicopter escapes um, not only made him a household name in Greece, it made him very famous across Europe. Um, it led directly, it is thought, to the Greek state attempting to fit him up, essentially, by blaming. Uh, so there was a. So Greece is a frequent target of violence, and in the process of doing research for um, a pamphlet, which is. Uh, we're, we're working alongside the book which we'll talk about then later um, I was kind of reading up about like the 2008-2009 uh, period there's bombings happening like every month um, because it's a very large illegalist and kind of uh, whatever you want to call it um, uh, thank you um, mindset um, one of these bombs uh, was a uh, po was, was an was a post postal bomb um, just a patch, um, which was sent to one of the, to a Greek minister. Um, it didn't get to the Greek minister, and instead blew up um, whilst the postal worker had it, blowing both his, both his hands off. Um, and the Greek state see, tried to pin the blame on the service um, by saying, "Well, we found a, a piece of bomb, bomb case." This is largely considered hokum, in as much as it doesn't fit any of the services. Uh, MO, like, like he's, he very proudly writes in the book um, that he has never taken a life in the course of um, a 20 year career of robbing banks and, and, and ransoming people. Um, he also doesn't really have any background in, in sending bombs or, or bombing things in particular. Um, and obviously, the final one being that if you explode a bomb, it's quite rare that you find very much of the bomb left over. Um, so with a fully formed finger print. With a fully formed finger <laughs> on it. Uh, so, so broadly it's considered that this is essentially the Greek state finding a reason to go after informed silt. And they really have as much as um, they put a 1 million euro bounty on it, which was at the time the largest bounty 
in Europe. He was sort of, you know, top of the Interpol lists. Um, and nevertheless, he's never been caught, so he's still on the run. Um, there's, there's no rumours that after his escape of him robbing more banks and then disappearing. Um, but yeah, he's, he's still a free man and wrote his autobiography from whichever place he's gone to these days. So that is a, a potted, potted history of free from the library of the I think what's, what's significant about the book is that a lot of these stories are known by, by Greek people and by people outside who have an interest in, you know, renegades and the like, and that it's his account of it, and I think that's what, make, that's what brings it so much of its charm, is that, you know, you can read these stories on any Wikipedia page, but to hear his... <laughs> he has a very, like, particular way of talking about himself and the people he meets, and it is almost whimsical at times, like, his complete comfort in his way of life, which is so, you know, ex like, external to the way in which the rest of us live, and yet it's absolutely his norm, and it, uh, yeah, I think the thing that is special about the book is just hearing it in, in his own words, like, these, these things, and just, like, you would never expect to read a book where you get sick of car chases, but... <laughs> <laughs> there are so many car chases and it's it, to him it really is like an average Thursday is a car chase and yeah like you know these are stories that are like oh that's funny that's funny that's funny but this actually was his life and yeah I don't know I, I think that's really <laughs> mental <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, okay so this is a bit of the context of, of the book I just wanted to ask you um, it's not really the book isn't really fitting in with freedom's kind of back catalogue, you know, Friedman's done a lot of anarchist theories and historical anarchist texts and history books um, and it hasn't really gone into the rip-roaring uh, thriller, thrill-seeking car chases kind of thing and also you, you, you pointed out in the context Vasilis isn't an anarchist um, at least not a declared one um, so I wondered what, what was the thinking about why did you think it important to bring this new edition uh, to, a, to the, a, a new English translation to this audience and and bring it to the UK in a, in a much more kind of formal way than what it's been done before. I mean, I wouldn't say it was outside of Freedom's remit to write histories of uh, famous men. <laughs> that is something we are all too prone to do. But um, on a more serious note, yeah. I, I, so, so, so with with, with the um, original read through of a normal life, like I mean. I came away very, uh, I, very mixed views on the man himself, um, in as much as I think that you know, he, like, like um, a friend of mine uh, who helped with the section of some of the uh, copy editors in the book, um, sort of talked about him in saying that if you if you've met a pre anarchist in his sort of forties or fifties, then the tone that the sellers use uses is very familiar. Um, like there's a certain, as you say, there's a certain way in which he writes and uh, kind of thinks in this kind of uh, semi-romantic way in, about, about things and all this kind of stuff. Um, but there's, there's, there's something that comes through on the book which I think it does fit very strongly into our uh, general mode of operation, I suppose. So like it, it's not just someone who, who robs banks. Like he's, he's very famous. Uh, the reason he's called the Greek Robin Hood and St. Basil and this kind of stuff is that famously he would do stuff like he would rob a bank um, they'd be pelting away in the getaway vehicle um, and he'd stop to give a homeless guy like just a wadge of trackman um, halfway through the escape right? um, there's also this very, this very sort of um, his, his description of the Greek justice system as well is in and of itself I think worth publishing the book um, you know there's, there, there's a lot of um, there are prison prison diaries and people who write about kind of justice systems and all this kind of stuff, but there's nothing quite so visceral as someone who is completely unrepentant, still on the run, so he's got absolutely nothing to hide in terms of, you know, he doesn't care about... Look, he's, if he gets caught, he's down for 150 years. Like, he, if he's getting, you know... There's Let's hope he ends up in Corey and Dallas again. <laughs> <laughs> um... So he says that he writes about the Greek justice system and, and, and corruption within it and his experience in prison 
um, and all the rest of it with just total frankness. Like, I mean, and he is, he hates these people, like, seriously. But not only does he hate them, like, he doesn't describe himself as an anarchist, but his critique of the institutions, he, he has an analysis, and his mm-hmm. analysis is absolutely in line with ours at Freedom Press. Like, whether or not he uses the same words as us doesn't really matter. Like, he understands the ways in which, like, the machinations of power actually function. Like, the ways in which, you know, the lackeys on the street, the bailiffs and the ground cops, and then the, you know, the higher-uppers, the businessmen and the judges and the, you know, the, what they call the people who work in prisons, prison officers. <laughs> like, how they all screws. fit. Screws. How they, how they all fit into this system. Like, and his, his, his systemic analysis of power and and also how to be free, I think, is, is one that is absolutely in line with freedom values. I think that's why it was important for us to publish. It's not just a sexy story. It's a sexy story with a moral framework that does align with our own. Yeah. I mean, there, I mean it's lo- as, as with any book, there's, there's a lot of stuff which I sort of read about in the book that sort of says which I don't necessarily agree with. It's like some of his viewpoints are things that I, that I don't personally agree with at all. But uh, the... The, the, the book itself is describing a um, a form of total refusal um, to follow the status quo, the guidelines, the rules which have been kind of put forward by people in power to stay in power, um, which I have a great deal of sympathy with. I was thinking about this the other day when I was thinking about like whether or not I like <laughs> And I was thinking that... If I was watching a film about him, I would absolutely be in love with him. But if I was having to politically organise with him, I would find him an absolute pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that kind of sums up my It's like he's an incredibly charming and charismatic and fluent and self-confident and arrogant and all of these things. And I think, yeah, he is a, you know, not in a, even a contradiction, but he's very true, but yeah, he's, he's a character. There has been an English translation before this of this text, but Freedom's done a lot of work over the past few months to bring a new version of the text out. Um, and I, I know from personal experience, having been a copy editor on the book, and and you two also having been very involved in producing the book as well. So, how was the text before you re- received it, and what was involved in bringing it to its current state? Okay, look, it was an incredibly impressive translation of a book that is 400 almost 400, how many pages long? Fucking loads of pages our, long. Our version is somewhat, somewhat compressed, yeah. but the uh, original um, translation came out with about 450. I can imagine what it would be like to try and have translated this from Greek to English, and I like, absolutely 1,000% respect to the translator of the text. However, there is... Okay, so why is that? Why is that? Yeah. I mean, because translation's fucking hard. Okay. <laughs> and it's a long book. But I will say that some things get lost in translation. And, like, a very, very good translation is not the same thing as a book that is a comfortable read for a native English speaker, which is, unfortunately, or fortunately, the target audience that we are reaching out to. And so, you know, the book has been previously very successful in its English language translation in Greece, and it could have been... You know, we could have just reproduced that, but we thought that since we had the agency to do so, and we thought we had the time and capacity to do so, whether or not that wound out true, we would we would try to make it as readable as possible. Because one of the things is that, like Greece, I mean, I don't speak Greek, so this is all as I understand it, but it has a very different kind of syntax to English. Like a lot of the metaphors are absolutely incomprehensible if they come with a direct translation. To give you an example of one of my favourite metaphors that he said, that I could not find a way of translating is it doesn't matter if you eat canned tuna or smoked turkey if you don't have big balls someone else will sew <laughs> and so, so sometimes we had to work with things that were I'm sure accurately translated directly but metaphor and simile of which Vasilis uses a whole bunch were just incredibly difficult and so yeah we you know we all worked I, I think I think this is the project in which every member of the Freedom Press publishing team has been the most involved. Like, everyone within it, we outsourced help to our comrades who generously would copy edit paragraphs. There's also just differences in kind of grammatical styles, like Vasilis or his translator uses a lot of ellipses and exclamation marks, whereas, you know, we are more staid and English. (laughs) And so we use more full stops and cut ends for sentences. And so, yeah, I think very difficult project. I think it was a very difficult project, the original translator, to turn something that is also 
in someone's own words. And that's the thing, because we didn't want to lose the sense of, of Vasilis and the way he speaks and the way in which he describes his own actions whilst trying to make it as comprehensible as possible to a native English speaker or other people in which English, English is the second language. There's also, um, obviously, one of the things which you get when you do any... Uh, uh, any, any biography in one uh, culture or another, there's all kinds of historical references and philosophical <laughs> references, um, physical references, which, you know, absolutely obvious to a Greek, but to an English person, not at all. Um, so there's there's one character, for example, called Avrantinos, um, who uh, is, is sort of mentioned uh, copiously in one section of the book, he's um, by, by, by Vasilis, uh, who is... Uh, he was a very senior um, prison officer uh, and head of the prison officers' union. Um, and the so this goes into quite some depth about this guy, you know, being being like just a real piece of shit, basically. Um, and it only comes into focus of exactly why why his description is so extensive when you kind of read about Avrantinos um, through the Greek through the Greek press, for example. Um, and his massive level of influence. Like Avrantinos went at one point he was accused of corruption by Greek by the Greek justice minister and the Greek justice minister. <laughs> this was how powerful this man was. Um, and he's only very recently been busted, like properly busted, um, because he was um, throwing um, prostitute fueled orgy parties um, in the prison. Uh, and was caught out doing that. He's now been busted down to amazingly be the uh, be a prison officer, prison guard in the women's wing of the prison. So you know, um, yeah. So 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 he's got all these descriptions of, the, of of kind of ministers who used to be part of the Greek resistance, for example, um, and you know various kind of historic events. Figures. He does references to Greek Orthodox religion a fair bit. Um, and then you have to be like, okay, so why is this? Re- what does this reference mean? What is what, what is the context? So, so there's an, there was an awful lot of like there's copious footnoting throughout the book, which we were doing, sort of saying, okay, so what does he mean here? Why is this an important place or thing or person? Also, one of the things I found was that like uh, there's a lot of specialist knowledge that really demonstrates his own interests. Like for example, to him. He will mention in detail every single different type of gun he uses, but to him, every single big car is an SUV. So, like, uh, as someone who knows very, very little about the different types of guns, I, it did cause me pause at some point, like when he said, I had a browning hidden in my trousers. <laughs> and something very different to me than it transpired it meant to Vasilis. And so there were lost in translation moments, even in terms of just his, his expertise and his interests compared to mine. I know nothing about cars and I know very little about guns. So it was also a learning curve. So, uh, a critique of this book, possibly. <laughs> no. It's a bit of a, kind of a blow, like a men's adventure novel in, in, in some ways, and that, um, you know, it's, 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 it's people robbing things with guns and cars and car chases, and having read a, a good proportion of the book, like women don't really, uh, you know, feature in the book all that much. Uh, well, what do you what do you think about this? Do you think this is just the life he was living, or how he was relating it? Like, how can we like, how do we account for that? Oh, oh do I get to do this one? <laughs> <laughs> how do we account for that? I mean, there's two different ways of going into that question, right? On the other, on one hand, if there was a book written by a woman where it was all car chases and this and this and this, would you say it's a women's adventure book? just a dialogue <laughs> question to the questioner but the other way of looking at it is yeah it could it could I mean it could, the problem is we don't know right because we only have his word for it it could say something about his priorities like he didn't bother writing about important female relationships in his life or it, oh so you see he's moving doing a talk about women <laughs> shameful <laughs> or it could say something about um, the fact that he just there weren't women in that environment because <laughs> He does mention women, and he mentions women in the way that sweet old men in pubs that I should probably have better analysis about talk about women, which is that she's a lovely flower, delicate lady, super beautiful, and I have ultimate respect for her as this almost foreign, incomprehensible being. And this is the thing, and this is not, I mean, 
the way you talk about women is, yeah, it's kind of almost charming because I don't have to be in the same environment as him. As I was saying earlier about he'd be great on a film, not great in freedom. <laughs> like, you know, every every female journalist or judge or whoever he comes across is, is madly in love with him within the first conversation, according to him. You know, when he has this, he has this very, very long anecdote about his road trip across China, which is actually incredibly interesting if you want to look at China just after it first opened up. It's a really interesting story, but every Chinese woman is, like, shy and beautiful and offers him rice. And, you know, <laughs> you know at the end of the day, it's a guy, you know, in his, like, old age, late middle age, writing an idealized version of his own of his own life. And so, like... I think we can take from that that either he didn't have many women around him, or he didn't think they were particularly important to talk about, or he just thought women were these beautiful, incomprehensible creatures that were probably all in love with him. But I don't think that attracts from the book, because at the end of the day it's a memoir, it's not a political tract. You know, if it was meant to be Vassilis on feminism, then yeah, I might have a few questions about why we're publishing it. <laughs> there is the fundamental as well, I think, that he spent most of his uh, professional career, if you like, um, working with guys to rob banks, and then going to prison where he was in prison with guys. Um, there is that, that element of his life is just a very male centric. But he does talk very positively about women at different times. Yes, he does. Uh, and I was actually going to bring up one particular. Um, so the uh, second of his escapes, um, through by, by the second of his helicopter escapes, rather, um, the, the, the main person who made it happen was uh, allegedly was allegedly well no it wasn't allegedly that it was a woman but the person who is in prison denies yes. that they were <laughs> um, but uh, but basically yeah like it, it was um, it was a woman who um, got in a helicopter put a gun to the head of the of the pilot um, flew flew over to the uh, to the prison dropped the dropped the rope ladder got them all up got them out again. Um, and there was a there was a planning process, obviously, because um, they needed to know it when it was happening and what was going to be going on and all this kind of stuff. And in the course of the book, he kind of mentioned a, a discussion uh, on a stolen phone that he has with it, with his woman. And there's this this tone of kind of semi incredulity, I suppose, because he he sort of he's very impressed by it. But it's just like it's clearly the first time that he's worked directly with a woman to commit crime, essentially. Um, but I will also say that in the translation of that section, he had left far more exclamation marks in the women's part of the conversation and in the men's, which I ruthlessly cut out because I don't think women always talk like this. <laughs> but the, the actual the case, the thing I was thinking of was the one where he saw the bunch of women bringing the food to the oh, prison. Maybe. And they had just decided autonomously that they were all going to bring them really lovely, delicious meals. And they were having this conversation with the prison officers who were quite bemused that all these women were like, no, we, we, we bring them nice food every day. And so, you know, like, he's always very respectful towards women, but it's always more awe at, whoa, look at this incredible thing that's happening that I don't understand, than it is women are my comrades who I work with, and that's kind of normal. <laughs> but again, it was the 80s. It was the 80s. Yeah, it was the 80s. <laughs> so, like I said at the start, we can't have a facility here because he's on the run and that's very good and we're very happy for him. Um, <laughs> so happy for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope he doesn't never go back to prison. Yes. But, um, Actually, yeah. uh, side, side note, his brother is yes. now out. And it, Mikos, who he committed lots of crime with, has been released on compassionate grounds, I believe, so that yes. is very good. And we're very, very, very good. Very good. <laughs> So, um, but we can kind of hear from him directly, and this is a kind of a little sample of the book if you buy it, and you will be able to buy it at the end of the session if you haven't already, um, and you should um, if you haven't. Um, so, Rowan is oh. going to read an extra. Yeah, you always do that? You'll okay. pound the plan. I know, but I, now I feel shy because it's quite, I don't know. So, do you want to hear an extract? <laughs> so, you nobody wants to hear an extract. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah, I think you definitely do it. Okay. Okay, well... <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. I'm not very good at public speaking, though, because I talk, like, 50% the speed of everyone else, 150%. Okay, well, take it one sentence at a time, you'll do great. So, I picked this extract because I think it fully summarises the way Vasilis sees himself and sees his role and sees his philosophy, but also the way in which he, treats to, he talks to other people. So... The extract starts with this young lad um, who, so he's in prison 
and he gets this knock on his, on his door, and this young lad is there with a platter full of beef. Land. Apologies. <laughs> I'm just paraphrasing the first part. Don't worry. I'm not paraphrasing the whole thing. And anyway, the young lad says that um, he, his uncle knows, knows Vasilis, and he wants to meet him. And so he, he asks the like, young lad, what are you in here for? And he's in here for drugs, in, in prison for doing drugs, for buying and selling. And so he says he's heard of uh, the guy, the young lad's uncle, and he wanted to get to know the boy. So he starts talking about the boy here, and he says, Fyros was unable to distinguish, after all the systems deliberately don't, between a criminal and an outlaw, between a lawless man and an autonomous man, between someone anti-authoritarian and someone authoritarian. To him, all these were games in a vast, dangerous amusement park for adults, where everyone was free to try their luck, being responsible for any possible injuries they might suffer, or even their death. He had a good big hole, which was in stark contrast to his lack of composure. He often lost control of the wheel, the brakes weren't working. He seemed like a Volkswagen Beetle with a Lamborghini, Lam Lamborghini? <laughs> Lamborghini Lamborghini engine on an incredibly tough track. It was clear he needed guidance before he went astray and down some dark path as so many budding out do, being swallowed and digested by the insatiable system. I have an innate inclination to protect younger men and keep them from such places, so I decided to have a chat with him. I held him hostage several evenings in my cell for instruction, telling him pretty much the following. Kid, it seems like you've got a lot of guts and you like boasting about it. Good for you. You must know, however, that prisons are filled with people who came in front-loaded and exited through the back door. Having guts and illegality is a great virtue, yet when the mon monstrous civic hypocrisy comes in the shape of organized oppressive mechanisms seeking to crush you, they don't prove enough. Then you're going to need morals and brains. They are proud, powerful assets that keep you strong and will never fail you. The way and the strength of a human being's thought is either their advantage or their disadvantage. The way we think defines our act decisions and the force with which that thought is expressed will determine the results of our choices. The power of thinking is what proves how much we want to achieve a goal. I just want to reiterate that this is Vasilis telling us what Vasilis is saying. <laughs> when your thought is expressed with a pencil, it is bound to be erased in the first storm that breaks. When your thought is expressed with permanent marker, nothing will erase it. It will become a little belief inci inside you, a faith. These build consciousness and morals, which are nothing more than the boundaries we set to our actions. They define how we position ourselves, our attitude towards the things and events that unravel around us. In essence, they are our individual laws, our personal constitution, and our autonomy. And we say, I do this because my consciousness and my morals allow it, while they forbid me from doing that. Mine prohibit me from selling guns, protection to small businesses, drugs, my freedom, my friends, my mother, my soul. They also forbid me from entering a house of steel, to kill an old lady, to become a snitch, to cooperate with a cop, a politician, and many other things. What do they allow me? Only bank robberies, abducting rich people, and being part of a revolution to towards a more just world. So you see how my individual constitution forbids me far more, than it, far more things than it allows me. You also understand how all of them are considered permissible in the minds of thoughtless illegality. The people around you are willing to sell and be sold, to buy and be bought. If anything from this careless list attracts you, then feel free to join them. But if you're interested in a selective, targeted, and conscious armed struggle with a vision, then I'm your man. Never forget that an armed man without morals is just a criminal, prey to the eminently criminal state mechanisms, cut off from the people's sense of justice. What I propose is to avoid a futile frontal revolution with a guard dog. A predator should not waste its sharp teeth devouring the plump flock. Instead, it should sink them directly into the shepherd's neck. That's the goal. And remember that the sort of illegality I'm suggesting isn't thuggery or merely a pose. It isn't easy money and living big. Instead, it is a constant struggle that tests human resilience, an endless battle against your own self and your beliefs. Our desires and our actualization are two completely different things, and yet we ought to fight for them if we want to be worthy of them. Your decision will be a foundation upon which you'll build what you truly desire. I advise you not to make such an important decision which can end your whole life hastily. If you take a step down this road, there's no going back. When you build your own scales and sword of justice, you'll be forced to weigh and cut only with these. And by these, it will be judged whether you'll be convicted or acquitted. So make sure that they're made out of the best material you have as a human being. You are called to become a raider of your own mind and soul and bring to the surface the most precious material for their construction. This road is very lonely, but having your own sword and scales, you'll never feel alone. The human herd who knowingly lost the individual tools most essential for building a fair society in which they wish to live happily feel lonely. A scale and a sword. 
Never give them over to anyone, because it is them that can set you free as easily as they can make you a servant. I'm in no position to tell if he understood all of this, <laughs> but he always had a big smile on his face. <laughs> he was into it. He was a kid who lived life to the fullest, and he showed it, and he was right to do so. One day, he was eager to get out of the cell, happy as he was, but I stopped him. I forgot to tell you something equally important. Our body is our only ally in this lonely road of ours. We live inside it, we move along with it, so we have to take extra care of it. We don't poison it with substances. No, no, I'm not doing drugs, I'm clean. Fine. Tomorrow morning, I'll meet you outside and we'll get some exercise. In three months, the kid would rip. <laughs> <laughs> And I picked that extract because I think it shows A, Vasilis' philosophy in quite concise detail, but also how he remembers the way in which he talks to other people <laughs> and how he sees himself as an incredibly inspiring mentor, which, you know, perhaps he was. In all fairness, he, uh, Sp Spiros then uh, joined, uh, joined the Arms Struggle mm -hmm. and uh, he died in the course of it. Mm -hmm. so, um, he, uh, uh, one of the um, little signs is that uh, in memory of his passing, various uh, Greek insurrectionists um, celebrated his life burning a line of cockles <laughs> in Athens. Right, she got the afterwards. <laughs> so he was, he was, you know, clear, um, clearly made a mark uh, after that. Was I'm sure it was just a speech. <laughs> 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 and the the book is full of of speeches like this, but yeah, I thought that one was particularly particularly Vasilis, I suppose. Like, <laughs> He is such a fucking character. <laughs> Okie doke. So we're coming towards the end of the kind of formal what we've prepared. Uh, we could say that the book is out now and it's on the desk and around and we can, you can definitely buy one after. You get 10% discount if you're here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Way. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, we were also, there's a few things that are being brought out along with the book. Um, so we did a bunch, we did a massive crowdfunding yes. campaign. This is the first one we did, and it was a lot of effort and work. It was so um, But part of the crowdfunding, we made a lot of kind of rewards. So we've got like a T-shirt that's going to come out. Uh, we've got a pamphlet of like stuff about Greek, Greek insurrectionism, this kind of stuff, and we have other things. Uh, you get like a copy of the pattern with one of them. You can get some more of our books if you you buy the. The books. reason why the the rewards, if you've ordered more than just a book, are delayed. It's because, as we have just explained, editing the book was incredibly time consuming and stressful, and we've only just moved on to the next stage. So please bear with us. Yeah, the t shirt is, is laid out, the pamphlet is most of the way through. We've, we've ended up doing a, um, a potted history of Greek anarchism, uh, which essentially sits in, in two kind of phases. You've got the um, 19th century and very early 20th century Greek anarchism, which is in and of itself kind of an interesting um, phenomenon. Um, involving various things like raisin strokes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the Greek anarchism proper, or modern Greek anarchism, doesn't start until the... It, well, it, start, it kind of starts kicking off shortly after the uh, after May 68. Um, and it's sort of heavily, heavily influenced by the Situationists, Operismo, um, the Red Army Fraction, um, the... the <laughs> the Red Brigades, um, all that kind of jazz. Um, this is also, you can, you, I mean, obviously, with Greek anarchism being uh, considerably more um, spiky and illegalist than, than anything that we've seen in Britain for a very long time, um, you kind of see those those influences go straight into uh, the politic um, uh, student uprising, um, which is kind of considered the start point to a great degree of the modern Greek anarchist um, movement. So the pamphlet kind of goes into details of it on, on the more specifically anarchist side of things. The foreword is genuinely very, very good. I think it's, it's uh, Polycarpos Chiodalis, who is, um, in fact, in jail in part because of his thought of vastness, because um, uh, he was done for essentially aiding and abetting a wanted criminal. Um, but he wrote it from prison, it was smuggled out for, for the sake of the book. Um, and he does an excellent job <laughs> of kind of talking about the factors which have led uh, anarchist illegalism uh, and outlawry uh, in Greece to become so popular. Um, and so something which is not only fetishized to a degree, but, but much more broadly accepted. You know, like one of the reasons that the Vasilis was able to, before his second arrest, 
stay at large for so long, despite huge bounties on his head. Um, in a very poor country like Greece, Greece in this period is uh, going through immense upheavals. It goes from, uh, as you can have someone on note, um, sort of inflation goes from, where do I it? I've lost me now. It's okay, Greek inflation is not in there. Sorry? 2010. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you said, what? Well, yeah, <laughs> 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 that's right. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's oh, it's oh, this, this is what we got down. Um, <laughs> but, but inflation in Greece through the 80s and 90s in particular is absolutely, is absolutely horrifying. It goes from sort of 45 drachmas at the, uh, at the start of the 80s to a dollar to something like 380 drachmas um, by the time it switches over to become the euro. Um, and this kind of showcases, uh, you know, precipit- like, like a major decline in living standards and security um, for, for, for the Greek people. Um, and you also have the imposition of, uh, partway through this, this, this situation, of neoliberalism and kind of austerity being used as a weapon, uh, primarily driven by the EU and Germany, um, to kind of, uh, you know, turn Greece into a, into a pool of cheap labour, essentially. Um, and all of these things really are driving forces in not only kind of generating this, this sense of um, ongoing social unrest and rebellion. Um, and it's like the, the pam- any pamphlet which is trying to summarise this even vaguely is obviously a lot of work. <laughs> so given that we were running up against deadline for the book, pamphlet is, is thus taking a little bit longer like trying to trying to kind of go through all this stuff and like, again like the, the number of bombings and arsons and riots and uh, police raids and killings and sort of explaining um, kind of the, 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 how the murder of a 15 year old um, in 2013 leads to just this massive explosion um, of, of rebellion um, which is kind of uh, you know, carried on through in many ways to, to, to very recently. Um, and the migrant crisis, which took place as well, um, all of this is, it, it, it does impact on, I think, on the kind of person Vasilis is as well. You know, like Vasilis and his brother in particular, because Vasilis is a little bit too young to know the Greek, the impact of the Greek junta um, on, on society. Uh, his brother, on the other hand, is seven years older and is in his uh, teenage years. Um, is not, you know, it's formative on the whole of the country, not, not lost on the anarchist movement. Um, and if you want to kind of take take a uh, take a look, sort of, sort of the, the first sort of serious political bank robbery, series of bank robberies is, are happening through the 70s and into the 80s. Um, and all of this is kind of tied up with, with the economic situation, which I'm going to do. Um, and to kind of this, this very wobbly Hellenic uh, Republic that's being established at the time. So, okay. Uh, thank you. So basically, we have the rewards, which are the crowdfunder, but we have more t-shirts and we have more pamphlets mm-hmm. which will be able to be purchased and it will help support freedom and support the book as well. Yes, please. And before I open it up to any contributions that people have, if you want to make a contribution, you obviously cost welcome to. Um, in that we were very thankful to our um, the, the Greek publishers of the book mm-hmm, yeah. who brought freedom to to bring this English translation into the world and uh, so we're thankful for them for allowing us to do it and giving us the translation and um, it's been uh, it's been super instructive for us to, to take on this project and uh, we hope you find the book useful, enjoyable, and a rip roaring tale. And thank you to our crowdfunder supporters mm. who, you know, without their initial support, would not have probably, we've been really, really fucked right now. We, had, we, had, we also, we had a lot of generous donations from people who, who sort of, you know, were way above um, sort of the, the cost of the book. Yeah. Kind of thing. Um, thank you all. Cool. So, if anyone has any contributions, you'd be welcome to make them. Any questions, any comments, anything that we got drastically wrong? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just uh, because you mentioned in the beginning that uh, Paolo Costas was a fan of uh, 17N. Mm. Um, because of uh, Dimitris Kufodina's uh, food strike last year, there's this thing with the two big figures in Greek anarchy, and we can talk about Vasilis Palaiokostas and Dimitris Kupotinas being two main figures, as 
not because they were anarchists, because they weren't really anarchists, but because they made it through. They had a vision and they didn't stay discussing for it over and over again, which is kind of a plague in <laughs> Greek anarchist community. Yeah. But they actually did it. And because a lot of people have, from my experience, have felt a, a little bit let down by Dimitris Kupadinas and the way that the strike ended and how some leftist communities and ambassadors talked him through it to end it while Greece was burning at the time and there was something feeling like a really big revolt that would happen. I'm not really saying that it would be okay he died because that's not what I'm talking about, but there is a bit of feeling that one of the main figures which was in Medrisco has let us down in a way. But Kalokostas has told the story and has made it through in a way that yeah, he would be the guy, the 50-year-old guy who would sit there and has a, had a story to tell again and again and again. But he has been, I mean, he stayed true. And that's the thing with the Greek translation, the, the Greek the Greek book as well, that you read it and you feel that he's a, a kind of a punk in a way. <laughs> we, we use this thing in Greek where we call someone a punk if they remain true to themselves from the beginning till the end. I don't know if in the UK you can actually say that. But, no, but, but that's not what punk means. But, <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, yeah authentic. And yeah. that's the thing with Palapos, is that even though he's not an artist, per se, he remains true to himself and to what he, he believed from the beginning till now, till, you know, the publishing of the book. Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it does, it does, yeah, um, like in the English version, it does come across that kind of um, incredible level of bloody-mindedness. There's definitely a, um, a sense of him being poetic and minded yeah. writer, and I yeah, imagine he's very fluidly, does it Simple and philosophical, yeah. yeah. that, that's the thing that he doesn't really, yeah, it's what you said with ellipsis, yeah. that, but, but that the meaning is conveyed in a way that he has been through it. You know? mm. That's why he cuts the sentences. That ha that's yeah. the thing. This is what was really it was so hard though, because a lot of it seems jarring. But then you want to keep the way he's speaking. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I'm sure in the original Greek it makes like. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, I, I had a question else? because you said that you have uh, this edition is smaller. And well, it's not smaller, so we have a pattern. Just because there's really thin margins. <laughs> <laughs> we try to make our books as cheap as possible. There are less pages. So we have fewer pages um, and smaller writing. But about um, the references that have to do with Greek politics and Greek history, do you give an explanation to this? or is it, oh, as, it far as, well, as far as, you know, obviously so within, okay. within the boundaries of, of the okay. availability of research. Yeah, okay. Um, so, I mean, so as much as we can do by like Wikipedia mm -hmm. or <laughs> Obviously, Kalei Kostas is like, like, he's, like, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's writing for a, he's writing in Greek for a Greek audience, at least mm -hmm. initially. So he's just making these references to, to people who would be incredibly well known, yes. but to English people and not at all well known. So you'd have to explain it there for them to get more. Yeah, I mean, I mean like sort of, yeah, you know, like seeing members of, of Ben 17 and like. Um, particularly, there's a whole set of, of um, this who were in power at the time that he was he was, he was doing his thing, who had direct connections, I think Passock ministers in particular, mm -hmm. um, to you know um, armed struggle, who he's he's incredibly like harsh on. Uh, well, not harsh on. I mean, you know, he just considers them fakes and fake. Um, they are ministers. Uh, but it's like it's difficult to get the sense of why he's so angry at them without doing the full research and like so you know, what did they do like there's one minister who's no I, I i don't remember who is famous for for swimming from corfu prison to freedom um yeah <laughs> all the way <laughs> down the thames <laughs> um and uh and and, and vasilis is like well, I've been in that prison, and I will say to you, I don't believe that he did that. That's a long swim. <laughs> but, you know, like... If I can't do it, no one can. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, like that, that, that kind of... He, he references the, references this guy swimming, and I'm like, what, what do you mean? You have to look up. Okay, I'll say this is what he's, he's talking about. Um, well, it was really, I mean, it was really interesting. I mean, it's one of the really interesting things about doing the book, yeah. is actually, like... 
I, I, I learned so much about Greece just by kind of just going through bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, well, if there's no more contributions. Any other questions, comments, critiques? Um, you're perfectly entitled to critique. Then I'm gonna we're gonna end the stream first of all, and we'll end the event too. Uh, like I said, if you want to buy the book, it's over there. Thank um, you. But thank you all for coming. Yeah. I mean, this was like a, we, we, it was going to be a purposely a small event because of the COVID situation. We didn't want to have a pack it out too much. Uh, but also that kind of ran the risk of uh, not, uh, no one turning up if you know we, we sell it's 50. Perfect. We've got 11 people and we have maximum 12. So yeah, so we're we're all in the end, <laughs> it worked out fine and I'm very grateful that you're all here and yes. you came down on a, on a Thursday night to, to say hi. So thank yeah. you very much. Thank you for everyone. Very much.